In our last lesson, we talked about how important the membrane is in terms of keeping the good things in and the bad things out. Uh, and we're going to explore that a little bit further in this topic. We're going to look at the role of the cell membrane in transport. But before we can do that, we need to have a, a review of the particle model of matter that you probably learned in previous grades. So here we go. Number one, first off, all matter is made up of particles, but the particles in different substances may be in different size and different composition. So that's to say that these particles aren't necessarily the same as each other. Uh, two, the particles of matter are constantly moving or vibrating. Particles move the least in solids and they move the most in gases. Adding or taking away energy will affect the movement of particles. So typically if you add more energy or add more heat, the particles will move faster. You might be able to get a, a solid to actually melt. The particles of matter are attracted to each other. There are forces that hold them together or bond them together. Particles have spaces between them that are smallest in the solids uh, and greatest in gases. And the exception to this, however, is water. When water freezes, the space between the particles actually gets a little bit larger and ice expands. Uh, you probably know this if you've ever had a frozen pipe in your house in the wintertime. The spaces can be occupied by particles of other, of other substance. They can fit themselves in between there. So let's have a look at how this might work. The simplest thing to understand is the process of diffusion. So here if I take a lump of sugar, uh, shown here with these, uh, these yellow sugar molecules, and if I place it into a, a beaker of water, something's going to start happening. The, the, the sugar molecules won't simply stay in one place. They'll begin to break apart from the sugar lump, and they'll begin to spread themselves throughout the beaker until eventually they're all evenly dispersed. And so this is the process of diffusion. Particles will quite naturally move from a high concentration to a low concentration until that concentration is evenly distributed everywhere. Now let's get back to this cell membrane bit. Uh, cell membranes are selectively permeable, and that means they're choosy. So permeable means you let things in and out, but selectively permeable means you're a bit fussy. So notice, for example, in this diagram that there are some molecules that can get in and out. So for example, uh, non-charged molecules in water, uh, no problem. They can pass through the membrane, it seems, with relative ease. But some things are rejected. Large molecules like this protein can't pass through that uh, membrane. And certain uh, molecules or atoms that have a charge, either positive or negative, they get rejected as well. So the membrane is quite capable of selecting who gets in and who gets out. So here's a demonstration of, of then how that can work. Let's talk about osmosis. Osmosis basically refers to the movement of water. Now here's a situation where we've got a salt solution here inside of this glass tube here and it's sealed off by this selectively permeable membrane. It, it doesn't let that salt get out. Obviously the salt the particles are too large to pass through that membrane. And we're going to dip it in this beaker of distilled water and see what happens. Well, as I said before, the salt can't get out of that membrane because the membrane is selectively permeable, but water can get in. And so here's where we're having osmosis take place right here. The water can get through that membrane no problem. And so what eventually happens, of course, is as we continue to add water, trying to dilute that salt concentration, we see the level of water rising up inside that tube. So what we have is a, a concept called the concentration gradient. How concentrated are these particles? If we look, for example, at these molecules of green dye, we can see that they're very concentrated on this side of the membrane. And they're going to naturally move to an area that has a low concentration. We call that the concentration gradient. You can almost think of these molecules as moving downhill. It's like when they're highly concentrated, they're up high on a hill. And if we just let them go and give them half a chance, they're going to spread themselves out until they reach this situation where they're even on both sides of the membrane and then relative movement is going to stop. Now a little refinement to that is it doesn't matter if you have different particles. So for example if I have uh, purple particles here and green particles here notice that they both will distribute themselves. The pur purple ones will get themselves organized left and right and so will the green ones. Uh, in other words it's like they pay no attention to each other. They're really only concerned about their own concentration and so eventually you'll end up with a situation well, finally over here where the purple particles and the green particles they're both evenly distributed according to their pleasure. Now what does this do for living things? Let's have a look at animal cells and plant cells here and see what happens in the situation of water. Now 
what I have here is three solutions. Uh, over on the left, in very, very pale blue background, I have what's called a hypotonic solution. Whereas over here on the right, I have what's called a hypertonic solution. Now let's understand that. The word hypo, the word hypo means under or low. So for example, when you go to the hospital and they give you a, a hypodermic needle, that's a needle that goes under your skin, right? Dermic is skin, hypo means under. A hypodermic needle goes under your skin. So a hypotonic solution is one in which the concentration of water is pretty low. That's why the background here is a very, very pale blue. Now over here on the right hand side is the exact opposite. This is a hypertonic solution. Now we know what that means. The word hyper means extra or more. So we talk about a hyperactive kid in the classroom. So this is a kid who can't settle down. Um, so we show this by showing a dark blue background. Now in the middle is something that's the same both inside the cell and outside the cell and that's called an isotonic solution. Try to pay attention to this because kids always get hypotonic and hypertonic mixed up. Understand what the words mean and it'll help you a lot better. Let's go back to the hypotonic solution situation. So here we have uh, a lot of water shown in pale blue and inside the cell uh, we have a concentration of solutes. So what's going to happen in both cases, in the animal cell and the plant cell, water is going to move into the cell trying to dilute the concentration of ingredients that are inside the cell. Well now if you're a plant cell that's not really a problem. You'll swell up a little bit but kind of like a football you're not going to burst because you've got this very very tough and strong uh, cell wall around the outside. But this will make you make you very rigid and so this is what allows plants for example to stand up upright because they're so full of water pressure. Now in the case of an animal cell, this could be a problem. An animal cell doesn't have a thick membrane and so if it keeps on absorbing that water and can't get rid of it, uh, then it could actually cause that animal cell to burst. Now in an isotonic situation, as you can see here, everything is equal. The water going into the cell and the water going out of the cell is exactly the same. So the concentration of water and the concentration of the cytoplasm in the cell, they're exactly the same. In a hypertonic situation, we have something very, very different. Here we have water that is has a very high concentration of, say, salt in it. And so what will happen is the opposite. Now, water will leave the cell. It will exit the cell, trying to go out into that hypertonic solution, trying to dilute it. And so what's going to happen is these cells are going to lose an awful lot of water. The animal cell will shrivel up. And this could be dangerous. It could die. Uh, the plant cell becomes what we call plasmalized. You can actually see the, uh, the cell membrane is pulling away from the cell wall as it shrinks and takes up less space. So this could be quite dangerous. This is how cells might lose water. We have various ways of getting uh, things into the cell. Two of the big processes are called passive and active transport. In passive transport, there's no energy being used. That's the big thing to understand about this guy. No energy is being spent to do this. And the techniques are diffusion, as we've already talked about. So this is molecules moving from a high concentration up here to a low concentration. Following their concentration gradient, they do it quite naturally. Facilitated diffusion is a situation where the diffusion is helped by certain protein molecules like this one who are embedded in the membrane. This one's got a little tunnel running through the middle. Kind of helps that molecule get through. The other type is what's called active transport. And the big thing about this one is, yes, it uses energy. What we're going to do here is we're going to try and move molecules against the concentration gradient. In other words, we're going to take molecules that are in a low concentration on the outside of our cell, and we're going to spend energy to bring them into the cell where there's already a high concentration existing there. So this is kind of going up against the grain or going uphill. If you're going to do this, it, you're going to have to use some energy represented by the usage of ATP here. And so this is called active transport. Another technique that cells have to get things in and out is what is called endocytosis and exocytosis. These are pretty easy to sort out if you think that the word endo means in and the word exo means exit or going out. 
So uh, plant and animal cells can actually manipulate their membrane here to engulf a food particle. So we actually make a little pocket around this food particle, close it off and make a vesicle. We can then digest whatever's inside there. Uh, we can then distribute what the goodies to the cytoplasm of the cell. And the waste, we can take that membrane and reconnect it to the membrane of the cell and open it up and allow those waste particles to be dumped, and that would be exocytosis.